Welcome to everybody. Uh, thanks for coming to the Latin American History Seminar. Um, I'm Tom Rath, uh, one of the conveners. It's a great pleasure to introduce Ed Shawcross today. Um, Ed is a recent graduate of the uh, from UCL. He received his PhD last year, I believe. March. This yeah, time. yeah. Oh, was it? Okay, right. Uh, well, so he's fresh out of the the PhD production line, and. Today he's going to talk to us uh, about the party of order and progress, uh, the European revolutions of 1848 and the Mexican Conservative Party. Uh, it's going to talk for about 45 minutes or so, so that should give us plenty of time uh, for comments and questions afterwards. So with that, over to Ed. <clears throat> Despite the trauma and national humiliation of the catastrophic defeat in the US-Mexican War, Mexican politics entered a stage of relative stability in the years immediately after 1848. For the first time in Mexican history, a president not only served out his full term in office, but his successor came to power peacefully through popular election. Indeed, elections became a regular part of Mexican political life in the years 1848 to 1852, with various groups coalescing into parties which competed in local, state and national contests. These various parties attacked one another in a partisan periodical press. And in the run-up to the local elections in Mexico City in 1849, one editorial raged against another opposing party's manifesto in the following terms. What do these men offer for the future? The editorial answered its own question. All that this party offered was to conserve what exists, capital letters, four exclamation marks in the original. <laughs> the editorial concluded in disgust. We do not need to explain the monstrosity of such an idea. The party with the monstrous idea to conserve what existed was not, as one might expect, the Mexican Conservative Party. Rather, this attack was made in the Conservative Party's daily newspaper, El Universal, against the moderate liberals then in control of Congress and the presidency. Despite its name, the Mexican Conservative Party did not wish to conserve much of what existed in Mexico in 1848. Rather, they wanted to overhaul the economic, political and administrative institutions of the Mexican state. This party and its ideas will be the focus of this paper. However, because by the 1850s, mid-1850s, the central issue in Mexican politi politics became, uh, became, sorry, the central issue in Mexican politics became the one institution that the party did want to conserve, the Catholic Church, scholarship has conventionally focused on the party's opposition to reform. In 1855, radical liberals, most notably Benito Juarez, came to power and passed a series of anti-clerical reforms and then in 1857 ratified a new constitution which for the first time did not affirm Catholicism as the sole religion of state to the exclusion of all others. Having failed to oppose these measures politically, conservatives resorted to civil war. The study of Mexican conservatism is complicated, therefore, because its history was written by liberals who caricatured the party as opposed to all reform. The Liberals defeated Conservatives in 1861 in a conflict tellingly known as the War of Reform. But by aligning themselves with a French intervention begun a year later, Mexican Conservatives were presented with another opportunity to impose their own vision on the Mexican nation. This imperial project ended in calamitous failure. The intervention overturned the Constitution of the Mexican Republic and replaced it with an empire under an Austrian France uh, Archduke, Ferdinand Maximilian, supported by some 30,000 French troops. However, with, after the withdrawal of these soldiers in 1867, liberals quickly defeated Maximilian's empire and the Conservative Party that supported it. This liberal victory became one of the foundational myths of Mexican history and ensured that the Conservative Party was vilified in Mexican historiography. This opposition plays out in the sphere of political thought, where in Mexican and later Anglo-American historiography, the enemies of the triumphant liberal vision are turned into the enemies of the nation and of progress. The Conservative Party is calcified as a regressive organisation that, in the words of one liberal, contemporary liberal historian, lacked a positive programme. Its war cry was simply the negation of liberal ideas and principles. Or, as one recent historian argues, Conservatives defended a form of irrationalism and traditionalism. This paper hopes to revise this simplistic picture of conservatism in Mexico. As a reaction to the Enlightenment, conservatism in Europe and the Americas was a fortiori, a movement that planted its roots in modernity. Furthermore, 19th century conservatism is a complex, heterogeneous phenomenon. Indeed, for Mexican conservatives, the European rather than British or US tradition of conservatism became increasingly more relevant. 
Edmund Burke may have perfectly described the disease that destroyed the old order, but had little, if anything, relevant to say about the cure. The opposite examples of how to construct a polity in the face of revolutionary and democratic challenges were on the European continent, especially France. French models were thus of practical use for Mexican conservatives. This paper argues Mexican conservatism increasingly drew upon the European conservative tradition, <coughs> and that the revitalization of European conservatism in the 1850s provided ideas and examples that could be adapted to Mexican circumstances. Although, although recent scholarship has done much to redress the previous imbalance towards liberalism in Mexican history, the focus remains on the national or regional context of conservatism. This is the problem that Christopher Clarke has identified for the study of conservative politics in 1850s Europe. He argues that this decade saw a profound transformation in political and administrative practices across the continent, with a transnational exchange of ideas which mutually reinforced regimes opposed to many of the concepts behind the 1848 revolutions. But histories of the reaction to 1848 are too often national and thus ignore the wider European context. If historians have been slow to identify this phenomenon, Mexican conservatives were not. As early as May 1849, El Universal noted that the revolutions of 1848 were not a revolution of France or of Italy or of any one nation, but a radical and social revolution in which all civilized people from Turkey to Spain and from Canada to the Amazon River had participated in. And the result had everywhere been the triumph of what the newspaper called the conservative principle. This triumph, Mexican conservatives termed an international reaction in Europe and the Americas and one in which Mexico was in the vanguard. This paper analyzes what Mexican conservatives meant by this international reaction, and argues that from 1849, conservative thought in Mexico changed. Conservatives now proposed a path to modernity that embraced a distinctly post-1848 mode of politics. The paper is divided into two parts. The first section will analyze the differences between pre and post-1848 Mexican conservative thought. Conservatives believed that the instability inherent in Mexican politics after independence could only be solved through the imposition of their principles, which in turn would create order. Once order had been established, progress would follow through an economic and administrative overhaul which would modernise the Mexican state. And this vision of progress is the subject of the second section of the paper, both in its initial articulation between 1849 and 1853, and then its later implementation under the Maximilian Sec uh, Empire, under Maximilian II Mexican Empire. A quick caveat, I will discuss European events and ideas which impacted upon conservative thought and politics in Mexico. I do not mean to suggest that conservatives slavishly imitated European governments or that ideas arrived fully formed across the Atlantic in Mexico. Rather, Mexican conservatives saw themselves as part of an Atlantic world of intellectual exchanges, one that involved many participants, all trying to manipulate the ideas available to them in order to explain, justify, lay blame for, or otherwise make sense of what was happening around them. We will now turn to the problems that Mexican conservatives were trying to make sense of in 1848. As has been noted, the Mexican Conservative Party was not a reactionary movement that wanted to resist all change. Rather, it was set up in 1849 under the leadership of the politician and historian Lucas Alamán with the distinctly modern aim of contesting elections in order to win political power and then reform Mexico's political institutions. It was imperative that these institutions be reformed conservatives argued, because inappropriate ones were responsible for the instability of Mexican politics in the first decades after independence, a period which has been described as one of chaos unparalleled in Mexican history. The idea of radically altering institutions was not in itself a new one for conservatives, and prior to the formation of the party, politicians who would later join its ranks had twice attempted serious reform. The first in 1835-36, by what are known as the Seven Laws, which transformed Mexico from a federal republic into a central one, and the second in 1845-46, when a group of politicians, led by Alemán, attempted unsuccessfully to convert Mexico into a constitutional monarchy under a European prince. Space precludes detailed discussion here, but the three key elements common to both projects were one, a centralised state, two, a powerful executive, and three, a more restricted franchise. Most liberals, however, favoured federal republicanism, and in 1846 the federal constitution of 1824 was reinstated. For conservatives, however, this document was at the root of Mexico's political instability. They argued federal republicanism was anathema to Mexico's political tra traditions. Worse, it was an exotic import from the United States, and on a practical level had numerous failings. 
The party in 1848 was, therefore, faced with almost exactly the same problems that they had tried to solve in 1835. However, this time, the means which, by which they hoped to impose their political vision on the nation were dramatically different. While the central arguments for a centralized state and a strong executive remained, one of the most striking examples of how Mexican conservative thought changed after 1848 is in its attitudes toward popular sovereignty. That overly democratic politics led to political instability had been an axiom common to all conservative politicians, and indeed many liberals, in Mexico just as it was elsewhere. And thus entirely in keeping with this received wisdom, as part of Lucas Alamán's attempt to turn Mexico into a monarchy in 1846, he had authored an electoral law that excluded the overwhelming majority of voters from the electoral process, the most restrictive electoral law up to that point in independent Mexico. Yet only four years later, Alamán stood up in Congress and argued that direct popular elections should be the basis of Mexico's electoral law, while the conservative press berated liberals who refused to support such a radical change. This was nothing short of a Damascene conversion of conservatives into radical democrats, with the founding father of Mexican conservatism suddenly a tribune of the people. How to explain this extraordinary revolt facts? First, Mexican conservatives were impressed by events in Europe after 1848, particularly in France, and second, the party proved remarkably adept at popular electoral politics in Mexico. First, we'll explore how Mexican conservatives analysed events in Europe, and then second, how they adapted strategies developed there in order to further their own political goals in Mexico. In France, the overthrow of Louis-Philippe, and with him, the fall of the July monarchy, in February 1848, sparked revolutionary movements across Europe. These all had in common varying degrees demands for constitutional government, popular participation in politics, freedom of speech and of association, call for workers' rights, and or the removal of the remnants of feudalism. The impact of these events in Latin America is generally examined through the effect it had on liberal politics, and to what extent events in Europe encouraged similar demands across the Atlantic. However, some historians have argued in Mexico there was little interest in the revolutions of Europe. Furthermore, the Mexican periodical press's coverage of these events has been described as at best descriptive of events, but void of significant commentary or analysis. Thus, in Mexico, the repercussions of 1848 were not felt in any systematic way until much later. However, as far as conservatives' analysis of events went, 1848 did have a profound influence on political thought. Before turning to this analysis, it's worth pausing to consider the influential role that France, France played in terms of political culture. The importance of the French philosophes, the French Revolution of 1789, and liberal constitutional theorists, alongside others in the grand canon of French liberal intellectuals, is well known in Latin America. French republicanism was a model that many liberals in Latin America had long sought to emulate. However, less well explored is the influence of more conservative French thinkers and political models. But as a supporter of the Conservative Party wrote, France can be considered as the richest in intellectual possessions, the one that has attained the highest degrees in the scale of civilization and the most universal in knowledge. This should not surprise us. Many Mexican conservatives associated anti-clerical liberalism with the ideas of the French philosophes, to which the antidote was the European, especially French, counter-enlightenment. Thus, an editorial on El Universal explained, France occupied a key position in world affairs. It had been the centre of revolutions that swept across Europe, but it remained a beacon of modern civilization that set the tone for the whole universe. In February 1848, however, the tone that France had set for the universe was not, for conservatives, a happy one. The overthrow of the, of the July monarchy and the subsequent revolutions across Europe merely reaffirmed what conservatives had long argued, namely that a small cabal of radical politicians wanted to whip up the populace to overthrow governments with violence that endangered private property and personal security, while what they called atheists threatened the Catholic Church. And for conservatives, this pattern was most powerfully demonstrated in the Roman Republic of Giuseppe Mazzini, which resulted in the Pope's flight from the Vatican. Initial conservative analysis of events unleashed by the 1848 revolutions, therefore, merely required its writers to dust off their old notes on 1789 and adopt a few new words. The 1848 revolutions were seen as France in 1793 writ large and inspired by the same ideas. Socialists and communists were thus admitted into an unholy pantheon alongside philosophes and radical liberals. Events in Europe were cited as further proof that sovereignty of the people was a dangerous doctrine. Elections should, as Alamán's 1846 electoral law had outlined, be based not on universal manhood suffrage, but on a very restricted franchise. Indeed, the month of December 1849 was something of an anti-democratic special in El Universal, with at least nine editorials dedicated to the danger of elections and popular sovereignty. 
All were a variation on the argument that the principles behind this doctrine were irrational in theory and worse, disastrous in practice. However, events in Europe, and France in particular, combined with the political success of the Conservative Party in Mexico, soon forced a fundamental rethink of this interpretation. Far from inaugurating a new reign of terror, as Mexican conservatives predicted, the French Second Republic was increasingly dominated by conservatives hostile towards socialism and radical democrats. The constitution provided for the direct election of the president through universal male suffrage, which resulted in an unexpected and overwhelming majority for Louis Napoleon Bonaparte, nephew of the first Bonaparte. At the time, politicians in France, let alone in Mexico, had little or no idea what Louis Napoleon represented. But what was clear was that this was not a vote for a socialist republic. The two radical candidates in the, in the election secured just over 400,000 votes between them, not even a tenth of the 5.4 million votes Louis Napoleon received. Conservative success did not end there. What became known as the Party of Order in France, a group of politicians made up primarily of former monarchists, dominated the politics of the republic. The Party of Order won a majority in the National Assembly elections of 18, May 1849 and was thus able to pass a series of conservative laws, most notably in education, as well as impose repressive measures against political clubs and the press. Meanwhile, in the wider European context, the forces of reaction reasserted themselves in the Habsburg monarchy, the German Confederation, and significantly for Mexican conservatives, the Roman Republic was defeated and papal temporal authority restored through French intervention. Although France had taken the leading role in the restoration of papal authority, La Universal claimed it was a consequence of the whole of Europe, capital letters, allied in the name of the conservative principle. A principle which, the paper argued, had fought against revolutionary barbarism in the name of humanity, civilization, and true progress. Rather than demonstrating what conservatives had long believed, that universal suffrage was inherently incompatible with good government, the election of Louis Napoleon as president of the Second Republic and the success of the so-called party of order was seen as a triumph of conservative principles. Not only had the French people rejected revolutionary ideas in their own country through the ballot box, they had elected a president and an assembly that had in turn put down a revolution in Rome. It is important to stress here that this outcome contradicted the entire body of thought that made up mid-19th century conservatism. The key conclusion to be drawn from this was a radical one. Popular politics could be a legitimating factor for conservative ideas. France, El Universal argued, wanted to overturn the false revolutionary doctrines, and inspired by this example, a reaction was sweeping across Europe. This had important implications for Mexico, which had been both spectator and actor in the revolutionary drama. As had happened in France, the newspaper argued, it was imperative in Mexico that the party of order, order organize itself, capital letters. It was hoped that the newly found, formed Conservative Party would fulfill this role as the party of order in Mexico. And for a group of individuals who had railed against democracy, Mexican conservatives proved themselves remarkably adept at winning electoral support, even advocating a sophisticated system of tactical voting in alliance with radical liberals to defeat moderate liberal candidates. That the self-proclaimed party of order would imitate the success of its French counterpart in Mexico appeared to become a reality when conservative candidates secured impressive results in the Mexico City local council elections of July 1849. The next challenge for the Conservative Party was to secure a majority in the upcoming congressional elections, and early signs indicated that conservatives were on course to repeat the success they had enjoyed in Mexico City. Even liberal newspapers conceded that public opinion in Mexico was shifting towards conservative principles. The apparent popularity of the Conservative Party saw El Universal adopt language that would have shocked only a year earlier. The paper argued that the nation had called out to the party and that elections could be a beautiful thing. The paper conceded that Conservatives had been the first to point out the deficiencies of the electoral system, but sometimes the goodness of the people could triumph over bad laws and institutions and the principles of order, progress and reform could win out. The century marches, concluded the paper, and is necessary to march with it or be crushed. This newfound belief in democratic politics, however, did not last long. Conservatives were not able to replicate their popularity outside the federal district, and the elections for Congress of 1850 returned a comfortable, moderate liberal majority. Furthermore, the moderate liberal government undermined conservative success in the federal district. Here, con concession, uh, sorry, excuse me. Here conservatives won the primary congressional elections, but the government prevented the secondary elections from taking place on a technicality. 
Even more outrageously from the Conservative point of view, the Minister of War, Mariano Arista, organised a mass protest against the Conservative Federal District Council, with crowds stressing the lives and property of its leading members, and the Conservative councillors resigned in protest. Despite these setbacks, the Conservative Party threw itself into a third contest, the presidential election of 1850. However, the moderate Liberal candidate and Breton Noir of Conservatives, Mariano Arista, was victorious, with the Conservative nominee in a disappointing third place. Conservatives' flirtation with democracy therefore resulted in ambivalent conclusions. On the one hand, the party had had some success in local elections, and Louis Napoleon's victory, combined with their own electoral success, had convinced them that conservative principles could be supported by the masses. On the other hand, they had not been able to translate this success nationwide. They had been, in their view, illegally undermined by the national government, and finally had been resoundingly defeated in the presidential election. Happily, though, for Mexican conservatives, Louis Napoleon in France was himself becoming disillusioned by democratic politics and providing another model upon which order and progress could be predicated. The constitution of the French Second Republic prohibited the president from standing for re-election. In order to amend the constitution, Louis Napoleon required a three-quarters majority uh, in the National Assembly, numbers which he was unable to secure. Determined not to relinquish power, Louis Napoleon launched a coup d'etat on the 2nd of December 1851, first confirming himself as president for 10 years, and then a year later proclaiming the foundation of the Second French Empire. French Republican historiography has been almost entirely negative about this regime, and historians have only recently reassess reassessed its successes and failures. For many, though, Karl Marx still provides the epitaph for the French Second Empire at its inception. The first time is tragedy, the second time is farce. There was nothing farcical about this regime, however, for Mexican conservatives, and Louis Napoleon's coup d'etat led to another transformation in conservative thought. Napoleon Bonaparte's role in French history, according to Mexican conservatives, was the inevitable military despotism with, with which revolutions culminated. Not so the nephew. Rather, El Universal argued Louis Napoleon had rescued France from a revolutionary abyss, and fortunately, the civilized world seemed destined to follow France in its return to the right path, as well as in its mistakes. France was now the theatre of reaction and the shining focal point from which the lights of religious truths, religious and social truths were again spread. This joyful outcome, however, had by no means been certain in the analysis of European events which served as a parable for Mexico. France had been on the edge of an abyss because the Red Party wanted to return it to a theatre of horrors. Nonetheless, the revolutions of 1848 and the Second Republic itself had never enjoyed popular support, according to El Universal, which identified two forces in France. The first consisted primarily in secret societies formed in Paris and were essentially socialist. They were small in number, but they made up for this with their political activism. The second force was conservative. Its motto was God, Patria and Family, and it comprised almost all the remainder of the nation. It had immense power but undermined by a lamentable apathy and indifference that characterises this part of the population everywhere in the world. It was this latter force that Louis Napoleon had energised, first through his election as the President of the Second Republic, which was proof that the people in France were opposed to the new and exotic republican institutions that had been imposed on them, the language echoing the conservative argument against liberalism in Mexico, and second through the plebiscites of December 1851 and November 1852 that confirmed Louis Napoleon's seizure of power and the creation of the Second French Empire. In its editorial, El Universal wrote that this marked the final defeat of the democratic idea, vanquished on its own ground and by its own weapons. The lessons of this, the newspaper argued, were obvious. Every country, every nation, every people that have ever felt the shameful effects of liberalism can take France as a beautiful example to imitate. And these lessons learned from Louis Napoleon's rise to power would be applied in Mexico. His transition to, from Prince President to French Emperor provided another model that could be adapted to Mexican politics, because it was not only conservatives who were disillusioned with moderate liberals governing under a federal republic. Supporters of many time President Santa Ana, as well as some liberals, were increasingly hostile, and a, result which, a revolt which began in 1852 culminated in the resignation of President Arista in January 1853. The Conservative Party entered into alliance with Santa Ana's supporters and called for his return to Mexico with dictatorial powers to reorganise the nation. Prior to 1853, all Conservative proposals for change had been predicated upon some form of constitutional and representative system. The example in Louis Napoleon in France helps explain the willingness of Mexican Conservatives to support an authoritarian alternative. For these Conservatives, the French case proved that Mexico needed a dictator 
to restore order. Louis Napoleon presented, conservatives argued, Mexico with an example of his heroic valour. And in case the didactic nature of this editorial was lost on the reader, the paper asked rhetorically, who did not see the parallels between France since 1848 and Mexico? Mexico, like France, had been ruled by a miserable minority, whose power only consists in the indifference and apathy of a majority. Mexico, therefore, required a saviour, like Louis Napoleon. Those, people, those who brought this saviour, Santa Ana, to power, identified his government as part of what they called an international reaction that today is in operation as much in Europe as in America in favour of conservative principles. And in a private conversation with the French ambassador, Alaman made it clear what these principles were. They are those of your illustrious sovereign, principles of order, of justice and of religion. The founder of the Mexican Conservative Party spelt out what he meant. It is upon your country, it is upon your sovereign, that we base all our hopes for the future. We want to model our political institutions on those of France. Alaman added that we would even like to follow France's example to the point of establishing a hereditary monarchy, but failing that, we would like Santa Anna to have an emperor's authority and strength. It should briefly be noted that this international, international reaction impacted upon foreign policy as well as domestic politics. The Conservative Party had argued uh, from its foundation for Mexico to orientate itself towards Europe. El Universal maintained that in order to avoid another Yankee occupation of Mexico, Mexico needed to look to Europe and base itself, as Europe did, on conservative ideas, because this would lead to formation of an alliance of conservative principles between the nations of the old and new world. This was, not, um, this was in the interests of the European powers, because, Mexican conservatives argued, US ambition was not limited to Latin America. Washington wanted to export its radical democracy across the Atlantic. It supported the rebels of Hungary, the Reds of Italy, the socialists of France, the disloyal subjects of Spain, as well as the scum of Mexican politics. Not my words. As the Ottoman Empire was to Russia, so was Mexico to the United States. And it was in France's interest to enter into an alliance or mutual agreement in order to contain the United States and maintain the balance of power in the Western Hemisphere. Indeed, Alaman had made it had explained that in order to construct a Mexican state along the lines of the French Second Empire, it was necessary to have the sympathy of Europe, and in particular the support of France, because we are constantly threatened by US invasion. Was not, Alaman asked, the extension of US power over all Mexico, and perhaps as far as Panama, a danger for Europe too? This was a serious question for Britain and Spain, but France was key to Mexico's future. We are convinced, the co-founder of the Mexican Conservative Party argued, that if Louis Napoleon desires to save us, he can do it. He can show our independence and contribute to the development of our power, which would become a counterweight to the United States. In short, Alaman summarised in 1853 what would become French policy in the early 1860s and resulted in the French intervention. Whatever one says about this French intervention, which overthrew the constitutional government of Mexico and replaced it with an empire under a Habsburg prince backed by 30,000 French troops, it can hardly be described as small c conservative. That Mexican conservatives were willing to call upon the help of a foreign invader into, in order to impose their political principles is indicative of both just how important they considered their political vision to be for the Mexican nation, as well as their readiness to resort to radical means to achieve it. In part, Mexican conservatives' readiness to collaborate with French intervention was a consequence of their admiration for the French Second Empire. As has been seen, Louis Napoleon was viewed positively by Mexican conservatives. Apart from their association of his regime with order and the international reaction discussed above, its economic and administrative record was especially impressive for Mexican conservatives, who saw it as embodying exactly the model of progress they argued for. Even historians critical of the French Second Empire tend to acknowledge its economic success. Indeed, the empire is seen as genuinely innovative because it placed what we would now term economic growth at the heart of its political platform. Various degrees of state intervention, technocratic expertise, the democratization of capital and credit, and the attempt at the disassociation of the political from the social led to an impressive economic performance in the first decades of the empire. Together, these measures seem to amount to something new in France, because whereas leading French politicians in the years from 1815 to 1848 have been satisfied with the existing social order and unwilling to endanger free enter enterprise to help those less fortunate than themselves, Louis Napoleon harboured grandiose and vague schemes to eliminate pauperism, which were in part inspired by the writings of Saint-Simon. In this, he was encouraged by former Saint-Simonians, notably the economist Michel Chevalier, who went on to play a leading role in justifying the French intervention in Mexico. However, the idea that However, if the idea that universal suffrage could legitimise conservative politics, or that dictatorship might be necessary, a necessary precondition to impose order, 
were new to conservative thought in the 1850s, state intervention to stimulate economic expansion was not. In part, the emphasis that conservatives placed on economic growth, or what they called progress, was an inheritance from the paternalistic policies of Bourbon Spain. However, it was also born out of practical experience. Lucas Alamán was not only a politician and historian, but an entrepreneur with interest in textiles and mining. He had supported the foundation of a government investment bank to develop industry in the 1830s, and as Charles Hales notes, he introduced the idea and reality of modern industry to Mexico, however imperfectly. Prior to 1848, conservative economic ideas remained general, and more often than not, relied on the assumption that economic progress would inevitably result from order. From 1845 to 1855, sorry, 1848 to 1855, however, in the editorials of El Universal, conservatives began to articulate a program approaching a kind of proto-economic nationalism, which argued, amongst other things, for the creation of a national bank to manage Mexico's debt, moderate protectionism to help national industry, and government intervention in order to develop Mexico's infrastructure, especially telegraph lines and railways. A favoured theme for editorials in this period was that liberals had appropriated the word progress to refer to their own political project, whereas in fact progress had little, if anything, to do with politics, and regardless, liberal politics had resulted in instability and chaos that undermined true progress, which was material and technological. As one editorial argued, the steam engines, the electric telegraph, the other inventions that the century can glory in are not a consequence of modern liberalism. Progress should not be defined in political terms, but rather in economic ones the development of nation's material wealth and an increase in riches and power. Under this definition, conservatives argued, we are the most progressive. And the Conservative Party was in line with the so-called spirit of the century. The conservative concern for economic modernization is demonstrated through an increasing emphasis placed on industry, which was to be encouraged through moderate protectionism and government support. In one editorial entitled There is no freedom without industry, El Universal argued that Mexican society needed to be agricultural, commercial and industrial. However, cheap foreign imports would stifle Mexican industry, which would in turn damage Mexican commerce. Therefore, Mexico would become only an agricultural society and regress on the path of civilization and true liberty. The authority which the editorial quoted at length in order to prove its point was none other than Louis Napoleon's future economic advisor, Michel Chevalier. In a series of articles arguing for Mexico's nascent textile industry to protect it against foreign imports, El Universal outlined its tariff policy. Independence had resulted in economic as well as political liberalism. These two doctrines had nearly destroyed Mexican industry, but protective tariffs introduced in 1837 saved what was left and allowed it to prosper. These tariffs should not be lowered, as liberals argued, because Mexico needed to develop its industry in order to free itself from becoming an economic tributary to other nations. The newspaper argued that British economic power came primarily from its textile industry. It therefore followed that if Mexico too wanted to be a great nation, it must develop this industry. Free trade would destroy this. It was a policy that Britain imposed on other nations in order to make them economic and political vassals dependent on foreign industry. Indeed, the newspaper argued that Britain had only achieved its current global dominance as a consequence of private corporations acting on behalf of the state, the subjugation of India, and protectionism. While the reciprocal free trade it was now advancing through diplomacy was merely protectionism under another name, because no other nation could compete with British manufacturers. El Universal championed a number of other causes that it believed would lead to economic development. In terms of agriculture, the newspaper backed the introduction of new scientific methods to increase production, praising and publicizing the first course in agronomy offered in Mexico. The newspaper also supported societies that were devel devoted to economic development. A member of the Conservative Party took the leading role in trying, ultimately unsuccessfully, to found a national bank, a project of which was supported in the Conservative press. Finally, El Universal campaigned ceaselessly throughout the period for the development of communications and infrastructure, especially railway and telegraph lines, but also roads, canals, and lighthouses. One of the problems with, with studying con conservative economic thought is that the party never held power independently or uncontested at any point in Mexican history. Thus, their ideas, by and large, remained in the realm of proposals, not policy. However, a brief, brief glimpse at the practical role conservatives felt they could play in economic development is provided by a fruit and flower festival organized by the party while they headed the Mexican city local council in 1849. Liberal opponents claim that the prizes and offer through this festival were the wrong incentive with which to encourage economic development and attack the enterprise as a paternalistic throwback to the 18th century. Conservatives, however, argued that their fruit and flower exhibition was the height of modernity. It was the duty of government to stimulate industry. And this was the first project of its kind in Mexico that would lead to many others. And they compared their festival to the great industrial exhibitions of Britain and France. 
The Conservative Council argued that it, it wanted to give palpable proof that it knew at heart the interests of the people, that it possessed what it called the intellectual means and necessary energy to serve the interests of the people in an enlightened and practical way. Moreover, Conservatives claimed that they had constantly argued the case of government-led economic development but had been ignored. Thus the Council was taking action into its own hands to show how it could be done. This was Conservative economic policy in action, so to speak. And it was also making the important political point as to the practical benefits of conservatism over the abstract theories of liberalism. Despite the increasing centrality of the issue of the church in Mexican politics and the consequent radicalization of both sides in the debate, the conservative path to modernity remained a central platform of the conservative party's political program from the mid-1850s to the defeat of Maximilian's empire. It is notable that while the leaders of the party from 1849 to 53 were civilian, from 1858 they tended to be military generals. Nonetheless, Miguel Miramón, who became president of the Conservative Party in 1859 during the War of Reform, restated the ideas of the former civilian leaders. He presented his manifesto for the Mexican nation in a proclamation of July 1859. What is striking about this document at the heart of the War of Reform is that it, he did not attribute Mexico's problems to the Constitution of 1857 or liberal anti-clericalism. -clerical, Only one paragraph out of 35 mentioned the church. Instead, he argued that every branch of Mexico's government needed reform, including the tre treasury, tax collection, education and justice. In addition, he proposed public works to stimulate the economy and provide employment. Conservatives were, of course, defeated in the War of Reform, but for those who supported this program, the French intervention provided an opportunity to put it into effect under French guidance. In 1863, La Sociedad, the successor to El Universal as the principal organ of the Conservative Party, ran a series of articles outlining the fiscal, commercial, agricultural and industrial reforms necessary to modernise what the author saw as Mexico's antiquated colonial system. This began with an article entitled Finances. This was, according to the writer, a word borrowed from the French language, and French administrators had already begun the reform of Mexican government revenues. What followed over the next few months in the newspaper was a discussion of political economy which ranged from the purpose and type of taxation to the role of industry, agriculture and commerce. Theorists were invoked, but on a practical level there was a model to imitate, truly admirable, as it is in all other branches of public administration, France. Mexico, the paper argued, was not an exception in the civilised world, and with the help of France, the same principles applied in Europe would work across the Atlantic. The newspaper argued that the reform of Mexico's fiscal structures, combined with order and peace, would mean that Mexico's economic problem, which includes the national debt and is the fund fundamental basis of all its social problems, would be definitively resolved. Development and modernization were central to the Second Mexican Empire, or at least to its rhetoric. The Emperor's speech for the inauguration of the Imperial Academy of Sciences and Literature began by highlighting the benefits of modernization for the Mexican economy through railways and steamships. French intervention would facilitate the development of Mexico's infrastructure because, European because of European capital, expertise and immigration. For imperialistas, as supporters of Maximilian became known, a strong government aided by European expertise would be able to fulfill the long-held desire for economic and administrative reform. The material benefits of the Franco-Mexican relationship would be vast. La Sociedad recognised that the interests of France were not absent from its policy, but, um, but were combined with those of Mexico, telegraphs, immigration, capital and the development of national industry. The French Second Empire was, therefore, a paradigm to emulate, and the work undertaken in France by Louis Napoleon has much in common with the ongoing work of Maximilian, or so theorised at another conservative editorial. Panegyrics to Louis Napoleon were published, hyperbolic propaganda even by Bonapartist standards. We pray to heaven that the Bonapartist dynasty lasts forever, and that it continues the work of the current emperor. Supporters of the intervention outlined the innovations Bonapartism brought to Mexico. The word empire, they argued, had been associated with absolute government, but Louis Napoleon had made an intimate alliance between the model principles of progress and democracy, with conservatism and stability. In short, exactly the old order sorry, excuse me. In short, exactly the model of order and progress the Conservative Party had outlined through its editorials in El Universal between eighteen forty eight and eighteen fifty five. So, to conclude, as this paper has suggested, the Mexican Conservative Party had a radical political, economic and administrative programme, which they understood as entirely in keeping with the so-called spirit of the century. The way in which this programme rapidly evolved is better understood within a transnational context within which Conservatives placed themselves. 
Moreover, political models often dismissed as failure, such as the French Second Empire, provided influential new paradigms for Mexican conservatives. 2016 has made us acutely aware that popular politics can be harnessed behind left or right wing agendas, but that conservative politics could appeal to a universal male suffrage electorate was a transformational realisation for conservative and liberal, for that matter, thought in Europe and Latin America. Indeed, viewed from a merely national perspective, the embrace of direct elections and the principle of popular sovereignty by the Mexican Conservative Party is usually understood as either inexplicable or a cynical attempt to gain political power. Rather, conservatives consciously hoped to imitate the success of the Party of Order in France and thus actively participated in re representative politics in the years 1849 to 1852. Just like Louis Napoleon in France, conservatives argued that the national government illegitimately thwarted their possibility of effecting change within this system. They were, therefore, they argued, justified in supporting the return of Santa Ana to overthrow what they considered to be an illegitimate regime. Moreover, this move on the part of the Conservative Party is conventionally seen as a rejection of the constitutional principles upon which previous Conservative projects had always been predicated in favour of dictatorship. But placed in the context of Alamand's overt statement that his model was the French Second Empire, it is perhaps not unreasonable to assume that Alamand, he died in 1853, had he lived, uh, envisaged Santa Anna's rule turning into a constitutional regime along the lines of the French example, rather than the personalist tyranny it became. Certainly this was the trajectory conservatives envisaged for Maximilian's empire, although circumstances of course prevented it developing along those lines. These failed experiments should be considered as part of what conservatives termed an international reaction, and historians should not make the mistake that because this project was supported by priests, opposed by liberals, and culminated in the imposition of a European dynasty in place of a republic, it was somehow an archaic and backwards politics. Rather, conservatives saw their policies as modern solutions to modern problems, a conservative path to modernity, which adapted many of the strategies and ideas developed in response to the European revolutions of 1848. Moreover, the efficacy of these strategies had appeared to have been successfully implemented in France, a country which liberals and conservatives could both agree was the most advanced nation in the world. A technocratic government concerned with economic development, state intervention and new ways to create capital, capital for investment, with elements of democratic politics carefully managed and a deliberate attempt to depoliticise social movements seemed to many at the time as the very height of modernity, order and progress. Further analysis of these ideas may prove a fruitful area of further research. Mexican conservatives claim to be at the vanguard of an international reaction in the Americas. What impact 1848 had on conservative thought in other Latin American nations is an interesting question, and an exploration of the extent to which the circulation, transmission and receptions of texts, ideas and intellectuals, both within and beyond state boundaries, influence currents of conservative thought across Latin America, may have important implications for national politics. Finally, these ideas debated and adapted in Mexican conservative political thought may have more importance for Mexican history than they are generally accorded. Despite a fondness for the ideas or spirit of the century, contemporaries and historians generally concluded that the Mexican Conservative Party, Louis Napoleon and Maximilian were on the wrong side of history. This paper is built on the work of scholars who have deepened our understanding of the ideas that underpin their projects, especially recent work in Mexican history which has demonstrated that the Manichaean division between liberal patriots and traitorous reactionaries is unhelpful. After, after all, Juarez's liberals disagreed with Alemán, but Alemán's analysis of the best course for Mexico, namely economic development combined with political authoritarianism, was one largely adopted by the PRI in the 20th century. While the San Simonian influences of French interventionists in alliance with Mexican conservatives foreshadows the influence of another disciple of Saint Simon, August Comte, and positivism. Indeed, Porfirio Diaz may have fought against conservative and French ideas on the battlefield, but he surely would have agreed with Louis Napoleon's judgment that what is needed in Mexico is not parliamentary liberty, but a liberal dictatorship. <laughs>